Dr. Sean Baker, I am so excited to have you here and to finally get to sit down and talk with you about all the things. I've been a big fan for a long time and I'm honored that you came on the Dr. Tina show. You, I, I saw one of your posts that you in your past life were an orthopedic surgeon and I got so excited and I wanted to bring you on today to talk about something true to my heart, which is joints, metabolic health and nutrition. And so would you introduce yourself? Tell me about your orthopedic background. Yeah, yeah. So I think Dr. Sean Baker, as, as you mentioned, yeah, I was a you know conventionally trained orthopedic surgeon. I practiced that for about two decades, part of the time in the military. So I did a lot of Afghanistan, did a bunch of crazy trauma surgery, went back into private practice, led an orthopedic surgical group for a number of years, was taking care of, you know, just kind of general orthopedics. I did joint replacements in sports medicine and a lot of trauma, trauma surgeries. And, you know, what I discovered, like we kind of alluded to, a lot of the orthopedic stuff is basically a direct consequence of poor metabolic health poor lifestyle choices. And I thought going in and being an orthopedic surgeon, all I was going to be doing is all these great surgeries and, you know, it had nothing to do. It didn't matter what the patient's lifestyle was. And, and boy, I discovered that about only in about 10% of the cases was that, that the truth. Most of it, 90% of it was just chronic, you know, lifestyle, poor nutrition, poor health, leading to aforementioned orthopedic problems. You know, the, 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 the rotator cuff tears and the knee arthritis and the back pain and the peripheral neuropathy, you know, the carpal tunnel syndrome the chronic tendonitis, all of those things are generally uh, associated with poor lifestyle choices. So that's what I ended up finding myself. I was still treating chronic disease, even as an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. At the end of the day. So my background, I am a chiropractor and I'm a naturopathic physician and I came to naturopathic medicine by becoming the receptionist for a well-known naturopathic physician who brought regenerative injection therapies to our profession like three decades ago. And he unfortunately passed away in 2013 from cancer, but I followed him around for 20 years and learned all about prolotherapy. That's when PRP came on the scene. It later went into stem cells after his passing. I started doing some stem cell work, but I'm an old school prolotherapist to my core. I love that more than anything. I love to use dextrose in the joints and around the joints and in the soft tissues more than anything. I think in a healthy body, it works beautifully. But what I found in clinical practice from 2008 up through, you know, close to the pandemic was dextrose just wasn't cutting it in a lot of cases. And as a naturopathic physician, I was running labs on all these patients. And most of my patients always had some kind of metabolic dysfunction going on, low grade, high grade, hormonal disruption, et cetera. And throughout that entire time, I would double down and let them know, like, this is this is your nutrition. This is your diet. This is your lifestyle. This is not just wear and tear. And of course, in chiropractic college, it was always, you know, wear and tear, wear and tear, have them lose weight, have them lose weight. And I'm like, what about what they're eating? I was always that girl in the back of the room, raising my hand. Like, what about what they're putting in their mouth? And I started seeing pathologic changes through my ultrasound probe years ago. And I would ask all my orthopedic buddies, like, Hey, do you guys see, can, like, I can see hypothyroidism. I can see sugar addiction. It, they've got these very characteristic little bone spurs. And I was trying to put all this together. And yet, even in my profession of naturopathic doctors, everybody just wants to sling needles and inject everything they see. And I'm like, if you don't get this person's metabolic health dialed, you're just chasing your tail. I don't think that's very ethical. That's that's it. Like, I think that osteoarthritis and osteoporosis and sarcopenia are basically one in the same. And it's diabetes of those structures. It, osteoarthritis is diabetes of the joint, in my opinion. And we have so many studies on this. So that's what I want to talk about today. Sure. Yeah, I think the, the point you bring up, and I would make this analogy, you know, like, let's say I have somebody who's got a very arthritic knee and I'm proposing some surgery on them and you go in there and sometimes the outcome's okay, but often it's not what you want it to see. I liken it to saying like, look, I've got a house and I don't like the, I don't like the flooring. I'm going to put new floors in. The problem is my house is on fire right now. And, and that's not a good time to put new floors in, right? You got to put the fire out first before you start trying to improve things. And I think that's the same thing. You, you see it with whether it's prolotherapy or PRP or stem cells. The efficacy of those things are going to be extremely limited if you're not fixing the underlying insult. It's like trying to take care of an electrical fire without putting out the, the circuit breaker. You know, you're going to continue having problems there. So yeah, I agree that we know clearly, even as dumb orthopedic surgeons, I say that kind of jokingly, we know that things like diabetes have a super high co correlation with things like frozen shoulder, rotator cuff tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, knee arthritis, all, all these things, they're all interrelated. And yeah, I mean, whether you want to call it diabetes of the joint or 
whatever, the orthopedic manifestations of metabolic disease, which is kind of how I would phrase it. But yeah, they're 100% cl- truly there. And we're seeing this as I was trained, perhaps you might, maybe in your training, you learned that it's wear and tear and it's mechanical forces and uneven loading. And, and that makes sense. You can sort of look at that. But at the end of the day, it's really biology. And we're seeing, in, in fact, more studies are coming out. I mean, there's a study I'll point to from, I think, two years ago where they looked at synovia sites. And, and if they're exposed to really, really high levels of, 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 of insulin, then the synovia sites start secreting these inflammatory cytokines, which ends up damaging the joint. And so it's basically a biologic problem. I mean, one of the most common consumer of knee replacements are sort of these obese, late to middle-aged females. And it's not like they're out there doing traumatic things. They're not doing, you know, football. I mean, they're basically been sitting around and been sedentary and their knee wears out. It's not because they're, you know, they're out there banging, banging into things. It's just it wears out. And the other thing I would point to is, you know, you think about why, why do people get finger arthritis? It's not because they're overweight. They're not walking on their fingers, but yet their fingers get all painful. Same thing with the neck. Their head doesn't really swell that much. It's pretty bad if your head gets fat, but I mean, you know, but, but in general, we see neck arthritis, a very neck and finger arthritis and non-weight bearing arthritis outside of weight gain. It's the biology that's going on, you know, and, and I think it's clearly related to diabetes or whatever we want to call this diabetes chronic inflammation, metabolic syndrome. I, I think, you know, gut dysfunction falls in there as well. But yeah, all those things, definitely. It's true. I would have patients who, and you probably had this too. They were always, I mean, frozen shoulder, classic middle-aged woman scenario. And predominantly that's who you see it in. And they would go to reach for a laundry basket and all of a sudden, boom, they'd either hear a pop or a tweak. So some kind of traumatic insult that was minor and suddenly the whole shoulder freezes. And the ones that would come in that were thin and were runners and they would say, Oh no, I exercise and eat well. And I'm like, actually you're vegan and you run a ton. And I don't know how nutrient, like how how much nutritional balance you got going on here, but this is a metabolic issue. We got to run labs and we got to deal with it that way as well. They didn't want to hear it. I would have your classic middle-aged woman, you know, sort of, and I don't mean this derogatorily, but honestly, just kind of that puffy doughy, their tissues were compromise. You can tell tissue integrity by a lot by palpation. And they just didn't have great tissue integrity, bogginess, hormonal disruption. And they would want PRP. They're like, my friend got PRP. It was great. I, I, I heard great results. And I would tell them the same. These are my exact words. If I take your hot mess of inflammation from your blood and I concentrate it down into a hot mess of concentrated PRP blood, and I shoot it into your hot mess of a shoulder, this is going to be very bad. And it it was always bad. When I knew it was going to be bad, it was always bad. And we might induce further freezing. We might aggravate things because they were not in a generalized healthy state to be receiving that sort of therapy. It was even worse with stem cells. If they were inflamed, if they had that, you know, who's that guy you always post on Instagram, the vegan doctor guy. What's I oh, never know. Michael Gregor. Yeah. I think he's, yeah. he's, the, he's the vegan God. He's a, he's the <laughs> all knowing, all knowing authority on all things, veganism. I, at least, <laughs> that's what I'm told. And he, you know, he's not doing too well from my perspective, but no, those you know, guys he probably, come... he probably has low LDL. So they're all things. Are <laughs> so he's good. Low LDL, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those dudes would come in and want stem cells and I would harvest their fat and I would concentrate it down and I would shoot it into their knees and their knees would swell up like, swell up like grapefruits. You know, I mean, like these, this, these is not, this is not good substrate, so to speak. And so that's what I really want people to understand is we talk about metabolic health in terms of surviving then all these other factors, cancer, everything really, if you want to live a healthy life. But what people don't understand is that it's impacting their joints. It's these common conditions that you used to do surgery on are rarely a wear and tear issue. Like you said, it's, it's poor metabolic health over decades. Yeah. Even in the post-traumatic state, you know, you'll have somebody that blew out their knee in college and had three reconstructions that usually sometimes often that'll progress to arthritis, but that is even mitigated by proper metabolic health. I've seen people with pretty significantly, you know, horrible looking x-rays, which are asymptomatic. And you just wonder why is this person's knee not hurt versus this other person who barely has any radiographic evidence, the disease is just miserable. And I think that's, you know, I think going back to the, the PRP stuff and the stem cell stuff, I mean, if you look at the position paper from American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, they say, don't do it. Don't do stem cells. It doesn't work. And I would say that my thought on that is probably most of the human data comes from these sick, fat, obese, metabolically unhealthy people. I mean, you probably look at some of the literature in animal studies where you don't, you know, you're not taking a, you know, a, a, an obese diabetic rabbit or whatever, you stu- whatever model you're studying. Rabbits are often used in joint research, but 
it's a different animal. I mean, literally in two different ways, it's a you know, different species, but the human who is fat and metabolically inflamed is going to have a very, very much different outcome than someone who's metabolically, you know, tuned up, I suppose. And so I think, you know, like I said, it's, it is a waste of time in a lot of people. If you come in there and it's the same thing, I see people that would get on testosterone replacing and they were just, it, it wouldn't do anything. They just turned, they just converted all into estrogen, <laughs> you know, because yep. you got to take care of the, you got to take care of the basics and the rest of this stuff is, you know, kind of nonsense. I agree. I got my husband off testosterone and he's one of those guys who's had significant traumatic joint injuries, lots of orthopedic surgeries, severe. I mean, you'd be, I'll tell you sometime his story. You'll be like, Whoa, that was hardcore what they put him through. And he has very little joint pain and I just keep him active and I keep him eating, you know, a couple pounds of meat a day and lifting weight. He works for a living with his body. So yeah. he's very, very active that way. Like good farm, strong guy. And he, I have, I'm the one walking around with all the crippling joint pain. <laughs> so he's, he's got it dialed. And it's so impressive to see guys like yourself and my husband just age really well, you know, like there's something really beautiful about, and I try to do this too, aging with intention and aging really well. I feel like I, I look better than I did 20 years ago and just feeling strong and knowing that I think of the joints as sort of the they're sort of the lightning rod. If they start screaming, that tells me something's going on, right? Like I need to reroute my diet or I need to be thinking about, it. I think you mentioned once too, that when you brought some fruit or something back into your diet, that your joints started acting up. Did I saw you on a podcast? Did I get that right? Well, I went on Rogan's podcast and I said, you know, I brought food back in some of it was fruit and I started having some more issues and there was tears for, Oh my God, you had an apple, you know, and everybody made fun of that. But I mean, honestly, for me, like I said, I'm in my, I'm 55 and I've had my share of injuries, I guess. I just, I, of course, I've never had any major injuries, but I, I definitely have been beating myself up pretty good for years through all the different sports I've done. And so when, when I'm not dialed in, I know it, my body tells me, hey, that's not good. And so it's very important to stay on that. And the other thing, you know, you mentioned about the lightning rod it's kind of, or the canary in the coal mine or however you want to use this. I think, you know, if somebody's walking around, they've got inflamed joints or fingers hurt, their knees hurt there's some inflammation going on. Probably it's chronic, probably it's systemic. And, and you can probably damn well bet they've got vascular inflammation and they've got inflammation in other areas. So if you're looking for heart disease targets, and you know, again, it's not hard to look at the literature and say correlation between uh, osteoarthritis and heart disease. And of course there's a relationship because it's, it's a similar pathophysiology going on. And so if you're walking around with sore knees and sore back in your forties and fifties, you probably have an inflammatory system going on in your cardiovascular and you probably need for heart disease. And so whatever it takes to get you from not feeling bad is going to help you across the board for sure. Yeah. It's all the same things, right? It's cardiovascular disease, neuroinflammation, joint pain, gut issues, like at their core, this it's this low grade inflammation. Can you talk about for the audience, how metabolic health ties into inflammation and how that worsens as we age? Well, I mean, it's hard to tease them out. And, you know, if we look at some of the, the sort of, we talk about a root cause of disease, and I think they're all intertwined, whether it's, you know, however you want to define it. We kind of are loosely getting closer. We're kind of drifting. Many of us are drifting away from the sort of uh, cholesterol-centric model of disease, which has sort of been dominant for the last, gosh, 50 years or so. And we're starting to see what is metabolic health. And so glycemic control, insulin resistance versus insulin sensitivity, chronic inflammation, which we can assess many different ways, both laboratory-wise and just clinically. But I think that as we look, you know, when I look at the, the common sort of things that are going on for all diseases, I'm, 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 I, most likely there's going to be some inflammation, most likely they're going to have some markers of metabolic syndrome, and, and very often they're going to have some issues with the gut. And I think it starts, you know, like I said food is such an important part of this. And you think about it. The largest, you know, we think about what, when we interface with our environment, we kind of think of our skin being the biggest surface, but our skin is designed to keep things out. Our skin barrier keeps everything out of us pretty much. We're waterproof, right? I mean, we don't let things come through, but our gut is different. Our gut is designed to take things in. That's how we absorb things. And it's designed to absorb certain things, but it has, it's, it's got a selective permeability. And when we start eating the, the processed industrial diet of this ultra processed garbage all day long, that selectivity becomes less selective. And so now we're absorbing all this, you know, foreign material that we're not supposed to be exposed to. And it's leading to an inflammatory response. It's leading to, in some cases, an autoimmune response. And those things all, obviously, those things all add up to, 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 to show us where our symptoms are. I was, 
I think some of the, you know, even some of the mental health disorders probably have an autoimmune component to it. I think, you know, like asthma, which I didn't know. I didn't know asthma was an autoimmune thing, but that's got an autoimmune component as well. And I think probably, you know, we clearly, we know things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus uh, and, you know, psoriatic arthritis. Those are all have autoimmune etiology, but even osteoarthritis, we're starting to see, I think there's probably some of that going on with that as well. Even though it's so common, we, we consider it just, you know, it's common to be arthritic. I don't think it is. I shouldn't say it's, it's, it is common. It shouldn't, it's not normal though. I don't think yeah. it's normal for someone in their forties and fifties to have arthritis. I just don't think that's normal. And, and yet we see it very commonly. I agree. I have always treated every patient who had joint pain as if they were autoimmune. I just, by assumption, I just, I don't tell them you're autoimmune. I would let them say that there's some immuno component potentially going on that we need to address through lifestyle. So if they came to me for injections, they were getting lifestyle management. That was just, that's how it went. Cause there was no point. We would just, it's like you said, you're trying to put new floors in when the house is burning down. I would, my analogy was always like, if you keep, you know, if you keep feeding the fire and pouring lighter fluid on it, there's no point in me trying to put it out. <laughs> I'm right, trying to right, put out right. a fire that you keep lighting. Yeah, you're, in there, you're in there with a squirt gun and they've got, a, they've got there's somebody pouring gasoline on the fire and you're, you're like, you're, you know, Literally. You're, you're kind of wasting your time. Yeah. And I could feel it with the synovitis as my needle would traverse the joint capsule, the, you know, the synovium, I could feel the thickening and I could see it under ultrasound, but I could really feel it. And with Prolo, it's so palpation based. And so you learn to palpate the needle becomes an extension of your hand when after years of doing it. And I could feel this thickening. And as I approached the capsule, I would watch their body tense up because I could see the pain was already starting to mount. And as I traversed the synovial capsule, they would, ugh, they grimace. And it was so painful. Once I was in the joint, it was fine. And I was like, dude, if you have synovitis in your knee, you've got it everywhere. Like the whole thing is a hot mess. Like just, you can expect everything to get worse from here. Each, you know, whether you have other joints that light up or it's your spine or it's your brain, or it's your, like you said, cardiovascular disease, this is a foreboding sign early on when you've got that, that, you know, synovial inflammation. And we know that insulin can drive that leptin can aggravate that. And so that's where, you know, it all ties together. I know when I was doing, you know, sometimes when we would do uh, knee replacements, you'd see a pretty profound uh, synovial, a very reactive synovium. And you try, you know, that part of the knee replacement was trying to remove as much of that synovium as possible because you, you, you replace the surface of the joint, but you're not replacing the capsule. You're not replacing the synovium. And so that, that again, you're not necessarily, like I said, when I was replacing people's joints, I wasn't necessarily fixing their arthritis. I was resurfacing the surfaces, but the disease is still there. And, and I used to take, I remember I used to think it was a compliment when I would do someone's knee and then two years later, they come back to, with me for their other knee because they, they, they were happy that I did a good job with their knee replacement. But it really, it was my failing because I should have prevented that second knee. I mean, I should have been on the ball and said, hey, look, we've, you know, we've lost a battle in this knee, but if we do things right, lifestyle, I didn't figure that out until later in my career. And so I think most probably probably most joint replacements, honestly, to perform in this country, and there are hundreds of thousands performed every year, are probably avoidable or could have been avoidable, you know, and outside of some very bad traumas, which most people aren't subject to. Most of it, again, most of it is just chronic lifestyle metabolic disease adding up over time. And that is 100% avoidable in my view. Yeah. And I'll add definitely hormones play in. As I approached perimenopause, I, my hips started barking at me. If my thyroid of Hashimoto's like, welcome to the club, right? It's like every woman who walks in the door has some version of thyroid. Dis it's like everyone who came into my club, I'm bone on bone. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to the club. So is everyone, but the hormones play a critical role. But I, again, I think that all plays back into the metabolism, because if you're metabolically unsound, you're going to be estrogen dominant. That's going to bind up the thyroid receptors. Like the whole thing turns into a mess of, it's like a soupy mess in there. And the joints are the ones that come out screaming and then people get them replaced thinking that's going to solve the problem. And like you said, you're not addressing, if you don't address the root cause, do the, does the synovium grow back after the joint replacement surgery? I can, yeah, for sure. And there's a condition called pigmented villanovus synovitis, PVNS, where you have this really robust pathologic growth of synovium. It's almost considered a neoplastic type of thing. And you go in there and you do this aggressive debris and this huge synovectomy. And more often than not, it just grows right back. And so, yeah, there is a capacity to regrow synovium for sure. And if it's irritated, it's going to inherit. It's kind of interesting. If you look in the orthopedic literature on post-op, joint replacement and patient satisfaction, the results are pretty good. You know, 90% of the people are doing well. And that's what we used to sell joint replacement. But if you go into the pain literature, like the chronic pain literature, the numbers aren't so pretty because you have a different 
perhaps an independent audience and they're saying, you know, probably 40% of the people still have significant pain after joint replacement. And that's probably some of this. You, again, you have not fixed the underlying problem of arthritis and maybe it doesn't hurt as much, but you still have pain because you still have that, like I said, all that soft tissue around there. And the, the joints are not just the bones and the cartilage, it's the muscle and the lining and the synovium and the joint capsule and the ligaments and on and on and on, you know, and then we remove the menisci and, and, and the cruciate ligaments in it, usually in a joint replacement. But uh, yeah, so there's still that. So you're still leaving that behind. So it still hurts. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. I, I want the audience to understand that. That's, that would be the patients who would come in and say, I'm just going to have a joint replacement. And I'm like, if your synovium grows back and it's inflamed and if that's the pain generator, then you're going to be right back where you started with a new joint. Yeah, you're still going to have pain. Yeah, you're still going to have pain. It may not be the same and it may feel a little different. And, you, and, you, and there's, and, and, you know, to be fair, stability can be an issue. A lot of people, you know, as, as the joint breaks down and the, and the supporting structures, the muscle and the ligaments break down, they become very unstable and you can, you can sort of augment that stability with a joint replacement. But again, you still have pain generators there. And like I said, it's not, it's not, it may not, it may still be the, the better solution, but again, if you're not addressing the metabolic stuff on top of that, it's not an ideal solution by any means. Yeah. A lot of it, I do think is soft tissue on the outside because there would be, there's a lot of docs out there doing, you know, quote unquote prolotherapy, but all they're doing is shooting dextrose inside the joint. And I was very much into all the extra articular stuff. Like that's was far more important to me is palpation, finding the spots that hurt. I, I do a lot of prolo mostly by feel it's not as much ultrasound guided because I'm far more interested in where it hurts, not where it looks bad. And those people would do great. Even if I never touched the inside of the joint, never went intraarticular, they would do awesome. And so I think that, you know, it's chicken and egg and I know it's different for every person, but man, people really, I, I think we just have this boomer generation coming up and we've got a lot of knee and hip replacements happening and coming down the line. When you read the data on what's coming, I mean, it's like, it's terrifying to think about how many knees and joints are going to need to be replaced due to just this, you know, like what, almost 90% of American adults are metabolically unsound. It's, it's like a hot mess. Yeah, I, mean, happen. I think we're currently, I think we're approaching 75% overweight and high forties on the obesity side and a certain, and, and, and I can't remember the number on the super obese, the morbidly obese, which, you know, BMI 40 plus is huge. And so yeah, I mean, those people are going to request joint replacements and they can feel happy to do them. They're going to make a good living doing that, but it's not a good solution. This is the other thing we're going to see in addition to this tsunami of <laughs> people with worn out joints are going to be people with dementia. That's coming yep. too. I mean, we already have, I can't remember what the numbers. I think we have like 8 million of people in the United States with Alzheimer's disease. That number is going to go up precipitously in the next few years and it's going to be sad because that's tough to take care of. I mean, it, you, you know, you think about it and, and it's happening earlier and earlier. We have people in their fifties that are developing dementia now. And if you think about it, you're a 20 year old kid in college, just finished college, starting your job. And all of a sudden dad is demented or mom is demented. Now who's going to take care of mom? You know, you're going to quit your job to take care of them because sometimes it requires full-time round o'clock care. So they don't burn the house down or, you know, whatever. So yeah, it's a real problem we've got facing us. It's kind of two from both ends because we've got these incredible rates of autism. And now just even imagining what these kids are going to be like, who've been masked up for the first, however many years of their lives and not developed correctly. And then living in low grade hypoxia, what's that going to do to their brains? I, I think about it from both sides. I'm going to be, I was like, we're going to be in the middle of this <laughs> trying to figure out how to navigate. Yeah, I know it's daunting. So let me ask you a couple of questions. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned just, you know, Let's talk about bone. So osteoporosis, metabolic health, like high rates of hip fracture and femoral fracture from high insulin, right? Like this is part of it too. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly there's a couple things. This is interesting. I'll just share a story. So I, I do a meeting every day with my community and we have one of our members who she had cerebral palsy. She's been, she was a nurse actually working her whole life was, you know, fairly sedentary, we got her on a meat-based diet. She had osteopenia as, you know, evidenced by DEXA. She just got it redone since it's gone. So she's actually fixed that and turned that around by eating an adequate diet, I think, wow. and, then, and then adding some resistance training. stuff. So, so without the bisphosphonates and all the other drugs that have certain, a lot of side effects. But yeah, I mean, again, once again, if we look at, and I've operated on a lot of people, and, you know, you can literally go in there with your finger 
through the femur and poke your finger right through the femur. So, so it's like cornbread. It is so soft and mushy. And you're trying to fix these things. And you're like, you're just like, you know, you've got so much hardware and metal and locking screws, all these contracts that are supposed to design offload the, you know, take the, take the stress and you're just kind of praying it holds together. But I see that again in these diabetics and these people with some of the worst bone I run into are these people that you would call them, they have sarcoplasmic, sorry, sarcopenic obesity, mm -hmm. obesity, and they're big, huge people, but they've got skinny, no muscle and, and really frail bones. And they're really, really a challenge. We're getting more and more of those people, but that, that definitely is a consequence of uh, long-term metabolic syndrome. And then there's another subset when you, as you probably aware, some of the vegan literature showing a, a very significant increase in fracture rates among vegans something like a 40 percent increase in femoral hip fractures and i think some other areas i think all in all areas all cause fractures 40 percent increase which is you know fairly significant and again that shows you how nutrition does impact our, our musculoskeletal and bone health absolutely i could not get vegans to respond to my injections ever unless i could negotiate with them on, and this is so funny. I would stop all injections. I'm like, this isn't working. We're not doing this. And I never started with the big guns. I always started with Prolo. It was more affordable. It was gentle. And it would give me a lot of information before I decided to have them spend their cash on something expensive. Unlike a lot of clinics where you walk in and they're like, we're going to do stem cells on you, even though you're 400 pounds, you know, that's not ethical to me. It's not ethical to even start with PRP in many cases. And so I would just sort of nudge them up and the Prolo would tell me a lot. And it was diagnostic and therapeutic. And the vegans and vegetarians rarely responded to the prolo. And I would say, look, let's negotiate. Would you be willing to take some kind of collagen supplement, usually like a type two collagen and do a bottle of that. Let me know how you feel. Nine times out of 10, they came back. They're like, I don't need any injections. All my knee pain's gone on the collagen. And I'm like, you need to eat. You can't induce collagen unless you're consuming collagen. I couldn't induce it with my injections. That's the whole point of prolo is collagen induction. If they're not having adequate supplies of it. And so that was everything I needed to know about their joint pain. It's like how much joint pain is just strictly nutritional deficiencies. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, when you look at, I mean, the collagen question, because I get a lot of questions about that. And we know, you know, one of the thoughts as well, you know, it just breaks down and your body rearranges amino acids anyway. And it doesn't matter if you eat it in the form of beans or animal protein, which is, it's actually not true. And, you know, interesting, we do have specific receptors in our gut we have specific transporters for things like hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine, which are collagen precursors. And so we can absorb that in already formed. And so that is going to probably allow us to have those building blocks around in great in higher concentration, which may help to, to, to repair some of the collagen issues that we have. And yeah, we see that with one of the things that the sad thing about orthopedics it is so not no one even cares about nutrition. I mean, I can re, I can go through all my review books. There's not a single the only thing about nutrition will say is, you know, if you have someone who's malnutrition, they're not going to heal as well, but there's no, nothing beyond that. You, can, you know, how much albumin do they have? You can look at a few indices and say if they're malnourished, but beyond that, there is zero about what's proper nutrition. How do you correct things? It's because all we care about is where's the OR and give me a saw and a hammer. So that, that's the fun. <laughs> you guys you know? are the jocks. You guys well, are yeah, the, the yeah, notorious yeah. jocks, right? Right. That's how it is. But you know, it's like I said, I, We'd sit there and nothing would make us, you know, our eyes glaze over quicker than having to read an EKG. It's just like, I don't, just give me the damn saw and I'll do, I'll take care of what I'm trying to do. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it so much is like you, like you mentioned about wasting your time, injecting people that, and I'm glad you're, you know, like I said, there is a, a lot of people who waste a lot of money on this stuff. They think that, oh my God, I've got a rotator cuff tear. I'm going to get a stem cell injection. Everything's going to be good. And then they're not, then they're surprised when it doesn't turn out well, when they haven't done a single thing to address why they have the poor tissue quality in the first place. I wrote a little article on this a few years about, about tissue, you know, glycation. We see these people with chronically, chronic high exposure to glucose through insulin, res, secondary insulin resistance. And I mean, the tissue just glycates. You know, when you look in someone's joint, like if you go in and you put a scope in like a, you know, a 15 year old kid's knee, it's pristine. It looks beautiful. It's white. Everything's, it looks like fresh fallen snow. I mean, it's, it's so pretty. And you get in there in a 50 year old and it looks like somebody's been smoking. It looks like the inside of an ashtray. I mean, literally it's all brown and the tissue is all very friable. It crumbles. That's probably the, the Maillard reaction, you know, this chronic exposure to glucose over time. And you get, you know, same thing when you cook meat, when you brown meat and you've got this beautiful, tasty, <laughs> tasty little, little crust on there, but that's not good in the human body. You know, you don't want that because it's leading to tissue that, that, that just falls apart. Yeah. I had a dude come in to see me. His wife came to see me. She got great results and fit, healthy, followed the game plan. 
he comes in and he's grumpy. He doesn't want to be there. His wife referred him in. I looked at him and I was like, Oh, this guy's, this guy's a hot mess. And I started with dextrose just to be 5%, like really low concentration, just to be, you know, conservative and see how he responded. The procedure itself was so painful to him. And my shots don't hurt. Like I'm fast. I'm good with a needle. I injected Mike Mutzel. Like I'm, I got some skills and I, got the tissue was so gristly as I traversed just his skin and his fat. I mean, it was all just gristly. I get into the, his synovium was super inflamed and thickened. I get in there, pop through, he's screaming. And I'm like, you shouldn't be feeling anything at this point. You know, we're in the joint. I'm under ultrasound. We're good. And he flared so bad from that. And I thought, so I called him up and I said, man, I know you want stem cells, but we are not doing stem cells. Like you've got some work to do we got to work on all the things. He didn't want to hear it. He went to the guy down the street, got the stem cells, spent thousands and thousands and thousands. And the guy didn't, the guy's a naturopath, didn't bother to ask him about his health, just did it because he likes the money. And his wife comes in and I said, how's your husband doing? And she's like, oh man, that was a bad idea. He's so inflamed and he is such a hot mess. It's just, it's a mess, you know, and he's weeks out and he's still, his knees are still blown up. And so now they've got to do the work to, and guess what the work is to undo that. You usually use low dose dextrose to unwind that kind of inflammation. And I'm like, what a mess, you know, he didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to do the work and that's how it goes. And there, there are a lot of practitioners out there just throwing this stuff in people's joints without that's the game. So what about leptin? I don't want to get off too far off track. So leptin resistance, can you explain that to the audience and how that ties in here and what that has to do with your joints? Well, I mean, we talk about being leptin resistance, and so leptin is one of these hormones that, that has a role with appetite, and it's produced basically with our fat tissue. And your brain can become leptin resistant, so I think it goes through the hypothalamus is, is how we do that. And there's some issues with blood-brain barrier that allows that to happen, but you don't become full, basically. I mean, this is one of these things where you just... It's one of these, you know, there's several hormones in the body that sort of help us regulate appetite, one of them being cholecystokine and peptide YY, which are produced in the digestive tract, and you have leptin. And, you know, when you can't respond to this hormone that's telling you that, you're, that you've eaten enough, then you just continue to overeat, and that leads to us kind of get this vicious cycle. And like all hormones, you know, whether it's insulin or testosterone or estrogen or thyroid, it, it, it interacts with every tissue in our body, basically. And we're just discovering that the muscle puts out myokines and the fat put out, puts out, you know, adipokines. And we've got all this, even the bone produces hormones. So all these tissues are playing roles on everything else. It's so much more complicated than we uh, would ever think. You know, what you learn in, what I learned in medical school, you know, 30 some years ago is probably 10% of what we now know as far as all these different interactions. Are, and, and it's probably, we probably haven't even scratched the surface on all this stuff, but yeah, leptin resistance is uh, increasingly common. I think when it comes to diet, I know there's a great debate about what diet is the best. And there's people out there who will just say that, well, it's just about cutting calories. You know, you just got to cut calories and you're going to lose weight. And it's a law of thermodynamics. And there's another group that says, well, it's all about hormones. And there's other people that say, well, you know, it's probably, it, it doesn't matter what you tell people to do if they can't do it. And appetite plays such a role in that. And if you can't I mean, you just can't deal with being hungry all the time. I know I couldn't. I'm pretty disciplined. I can sort of, you know, <laughs> grind pretty hard like the next year, just like anybody else or probably better than most people. But I can't deal with being hungry for too long. I'm going to, I'm going to cave. And so, I mean, that, and that is a hundred percent dependent upon what I'm feeding myself. And so uh, I think chronic exposure to this highly palatable, poorly, poor nutrition food that we have as, as most of our diets, you know, 70% of the year, 60% of the U S diet now is, this ultra processed garbage it leads to leptin resistance it leads to just continued appetite dysregulation, which continue leads to continued overeating, which just, it just compounds. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And then these things have effects on all our entire system. So, yeah. And leptin has been shown to aggravate osteoarthritis. You know, it's like it, it can induce more joint pain and people don't put the connection well, it's just like, you know, insulin. I mean, when you become resistant to something, what does the body do? It secretes more of it. So if I can't hear the radio, I'm just going to turn up the, the volume, even though I'm going deaf. <laughs> yeah, so I turn the radio up more. And that's kind of the same analogy. And we see that with all the hormones, whether it's thyroid. This is one of the, because one of the knocks, we see this around like, you know, thyroid, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're on a low carb diet and your T3 went lower. So therefore you're not making enough T3. Well, it very well could be become you're more you're becoming more sensitive to the effects of thyroid hormone, and therefore you don't need as much. 
just like we don't bland an eye when we say, oh, insulin resistant. Yeah, well, if I need less insulin, that's obviously better, but we don't sort of use that same logic when it comes to thyroid and maybe certain androgen or sex hormones or leptin or any of these things. You know, probably less is better if we're more sensitive, I mean, in general. But yeah, when you get big and heavy, you're making more leptin, but you can't respond to it. So you make more and more, and then it has downstream effects. You know, it has those, the side effects, I guess, if you will. I don't know if we're going to call them. I don't know if they're tr- truly side effects, but they are, they are effects that are our body responds to. And excessive lep- leptin will cause yeah all kinds of no- negative effects in, in, among those musculoskeletal. That makes a lot of sense about the sensitivity. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but yes, I agree. That makes a lot of sense. Well, you, I mean, you I've, I've at, thought about with thyroid too. I've, it's crossed my mind. Like maybe they just don't need to be cranking as much. Well, it's true. I mean, I mean it's Steve Finney wrote a nice article. If you Google Steve Finney, you know, P-H, uh, P-H-I-N-N-E-Y, Steve Finney, low thyroid and low carbohydrate. He's got a nice article and it's got about, I don't know, five or six references that sort of show that the literature-based experimental evidence which would, would, would support that conclusion. Stu Phillips' article on androgen sensitivity is another one that's interesting. You know, looked at these 20, 20-some-year-old college kids, put them on a weightlifting program, and they measured their sex hormones, testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, free testosterone, you know, some of the metabolites, and none of that had a correlation to muscle gain. The only thing that had a correlation was androgen receptor density which was interesting. So that was a, the thing. And, and what increases androgen receptor density? Well, weightlifting does, but so do diets containing a lot of carnitine, which is, uh, you know, meat has got some carnitine in there. It's got, that's probably the only place you can get carnitine. There's a, there's very few plant sources of carnitine. I think asparagus has a little bit, but other than that, I mean, there's, again, sensitivity. It's a, it's a two, you know, it's a, it's a lock and key system. And if you've got a lot of keys, but not many locks, you're only going to open so many doors. You got to have a decent ratio of the two. I like that. Yeah. Just be a better burning machine. Yeah. Just you ut- to utilize it better. All right. I have a question for you. Cause I don't know if I've heard this from you. I've seen pictures of you before and after the yeah. carnivore transition, but what brought you to this? Like, how did this happen for Dr. Sean Baker? Yeah. Well, I mean, initially probably six or seven years before I stumbled onto the carnivore sort of system, I was mid, I guess I was early 40, so I'm 55 now. And I was, you know, 280, 290 pounds. I mean, this is where I'd been for 20 years as an athlete. I was a Highland Games world champion. I was a big, big, strong guy, power lifter, 6'5", so 300 pounds is not that huge. I mean, but it's pretty big. But I was clearly, you know, developing uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. All those things were happening. And I'm a surgeon. I'm reasonably intelligent. I was training hard as an athlete. And I said, well, I got to do something with diet. You know, the answer just can't be eat more. Like I was doing, that was my approach. I had to eat something like 8,000 calories a day to maintain that weight. And so I was, you know, I'd go, I'd go out and eat three or three entrees for dinner and two appetizers and a dessert or two. And that was pretty typical for me. And I did that for years. So that was not a good thing. But it allowed me to be a big person and be very strong and win some world championships and all that stuff. But in, in retrospect, I probably could have avoided some unnecessary health consequences had I not done that. Now, so I decided at, I think it was age 42 or so that, uh, you know, I need to get leaner. And so I did what I thought was the right thing to do. And it did work. I mean, I, I said, I'm going to eat a low fat diet. I'm going to exercise like crazy, even more than I was doing. I remember I was, I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning before I had to go around on my patients, jump around, I'd do a couple thousand jump ropes. And then on my clinic days, I'd go home and work. I'd, I'd work out over my lunch hour. And then I'd go back in the evening, you know, I'd have to put my kids to sleep. Then I'd jump rope again, do another couple thousand jump ropes. I did it for about three months and I cut my calories dramatically. And I was eating just leafy green vegetables and skinny pieces of chicken and not much else. I lost 50 pounds in three months. I got down to like two, two thirty-five or something. I got lean and I was miserable. That I sounds was terrible. Like, well, I was just like, I'm like, this sucks. This sucks. All the nurses in the office are like, Dr. Baker, we're worried about you. And the, the subtext of that was Dr. Baker, quit being an asshole. We liked you better when you were fat. <laughs> I was tired. I was grumpy. I was hungry. You know, I didn't like it. I was like, I can't do this. There's no way I can do it. So I started in, you know, looking at other things. A paleo diet was pretty popular then. So I said, well, let me try this paleo thing. And that felt a little better. And then I did some low carb. And then I did a ketogenic diet for a while. And then about after about five or six years of doing these things, I discovered all these wacky, crazy people doing this all meat diet. I thought, these people are nuts. They call it a zero carb diet. And I, I, was, I was just... But it was more, I was more morbidly fascinated with this, this group of people. And, and I, the more I kind of just sort of looked at them and studied them and read some of the literature that they were sort of talking about, I was like, you know, this is at least worth trying. 
So uh, in 2016, I, I said, well, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And, I, and I'd done it for a couple of days. I did like two or three days. I just eat steak and eggs. And I was like, yeah, I felt pretty good. No big deal. And then I go back to eating, you know, whatever, the normal sort of keto stuff. And, and then, um, yeah, in 2016, I said, I'm going to do it for a month. And I was on Twitter. I had a little bit of a following, a few thousand followers at that point. I said, hey, guys, I'm going to do this crazy all meat diet for a month. What do you think I'm going to die of? You know, I thought, am I going to die of a heart attack? Am I, is my colon going to fall out? Am I going to get scurvy? And we had a good laugh. And I did it. And about two weeks in, I'm like, you know, I'm actually feeling pretty damn good. And by the end of the month, I was like, you know, I feel really, really good. This is, this is the best I can remember feeling in, in decades, you know. And so the month was up. I went back to my regular diet. And immediately, I was like, wow, my guts don't feel as good. My back's starting to hurt. All these things came back right away. And I was like, it was clear to me. It was like, wow, there's something going on that's not in meat that is a problem for me. So I said, you know, I, I really like feeling better. And I was already at a point where I was like, I'm not worried about eating fat. I'm not worried about dietary cholesterol. That wasn't, you know, I'd already kind of educated myself to my satisfaction to the point that I'm not as concerned about that. And so a month became two months. And then two months in, I noticed that I had chronic tendonitis in my right quadriceps. I had it for a decade. And as an orthopedic surgeon, I couldn't get it to go away. I did every, everything I could think of as an orthopedic surgeon, which I would do, I, I had attempted never got better within two months i was like my tendonitis in my knee does no longer hurt and and i was like well this is pretty cool and that was six years ago and it still doesn't hurt it's, it's gone it's never come back which i thought was just totally remarkable within six months i broke world records on on you know in the concept two as a full carnivore my strength got better i mean it's just been really a powerful intervention for myself and so i've been doing this now for like six years and as you know i've convinced a lot of people to try it <laughs> and a lot of people have and i mean literally there's tens and tens tens upon tens of thousands of people maybe hundreds of thousands of people now that have done it for a period of time and and most not all of them but most of them have had, had good results with this so there's something to it for sure yeah i i ate this way not completely but pretty meat heavy pretty fat like animal fat heavy uh way back. Like that was kind of my secret weapon in school when, cause I went to both programs concurrently. And so finals week would overlap and I'd have to handle it all as a single mom. And so I would go into the, what I called the zone and I would just live off of beef, basically <laughs> beef and fat. And I would get in the zone and I would crank it out and then I'd go back to my ways. And, uh, more recently through this pandemic and, you know, you've been speaking out, I've been speaking out and like, just vicious attacks and it started taking its toll. I just started wearing out from it. And my mom has Crohn's and her whole side of the family has Crohn's. My grandmother died on the toilet. Like they found her dead on the toilet. You know, it's, it's bad. And, uh, it, it made, it reared its ugly head in me and I, it just the glimmers of it, you know, I didn't go get tested or anything, but I was like, I know what this is. And it was wrecking my life. This was not that long ago. And my spine started fusing. I could feel it. My spine started fusing. I was getting like bamboo spine. It was just locked up completely and no chiropractor could adjust me. The injections that I know weren't working, like nothing was working. And I was like, this is bad. Like what's happening right now is an immunologic progression that is, doesn't end well. And so, um, I, I gave it a go and I got terrible, uh, diarrhea for about three weeks. It got worse things, but I was already having terrible diarrhea. So things got significantly worse for about two or three weeks, but I felt better. If that makes any sense. Like I felt better. And I started feeling my brain was starting to become impacted. And so I was feeling my sanity and my cognition come back, but I was having, you know, pretty bad stool. And then finally it turned the corner. And I got to say, I, it's when I eat fruit and dairy, that I get into some trouble. So I was glad to talk to you today. Cause I'm like, I was already thinking I got to dial that back. Cause it, I think it does have a negative impact on me, but I, I think I'm going to try just meat and see what happens meat only and, and go for it because I, the, my skin has cleared. I lost, gosh, I lost almost 20 pounds of bloat that I had acquired. Some of that was from alcohol. I quit alcohol in January completely. So I'm sold and I have gotten so many people to check it out and they have transitioned and now they're talking about it on Instagram. So the message is growing and it's growing amongst healthcare practitioners. And I'm excited for that because it's, but man, I started talking about it on my, 
on my page on Instagram and I lost so many followers in such quick, fast fashion, like gone. I was like, I guess I got a lot of vegetarians and vegans. I don't talk about food much on my page because people get so hyper triggered and I don't, I don't actually care how people choose to eat. That's their prerogative, but uh, I know it works for me and I've just been, I'm excited to hear from you. I know you have a big community and that have, you share a lot of their testimonials on your Instagram page, which are just so phenomenal shifts in severe mental, emotional schizophrenia, depression, reversal of lots of pharmaceutical drugs, lots of GI Crohn, IBD. Can you talk a bit about that? Just it's mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like I said, if you go to my YouTube, I guess I've got a new YouTube channel, Dr. Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, or something. We've got that. I mean, literally, we've got this testimony after testimony after. I mean, it's to a point where you're like, this, there has to be something here. Well, one or two anecdotes, but when you're into the many thousands, you know, it's people starting to take notice. Yeah. So, I mean, our community, Rivero Health or Rivero.com, we have thousands of members and it's just people that are, you know, their goal is like, I think as a physician, as a healthcare provider, our goal should be to cure disease and get people off medications, make their lives better. Instead, the healthcare system is symptom, symptom management, it's administrative heavy, and it's just about disease maintenance, really. We're just maintaining people in states of disease and, you know, just kind of playing with their symptoms a little bit through drugs and procedures and whatnot. And I think that's not the goal. And our goal as a company is to do just what we said. And we've got, you know, we're, we're, we just raised a bunch, we just raised about $5 million to start to really expand. We're gonna be hiring people. We've got some physicians we'll hire. We've got physicians lining up because they wanna do this. They're like, we can't wait to be part of something where we actually get to do what we did. We, you know, set an oath to do, you know, instead of just practicing in, in this healthcare system, which is just a business. And we have, like I said, just like almost any, I hate to call it a panacea, but just about any disease condition you can think of, I've seen a success, success or multiple successes with this. Now, does it work for every single person hundred percent of the time? No, it does not. But it is, it's probably one of the most powerful health interventions across the board that I've seen that works so well for so many things. And you think about it, nutrition is so powerful, as I mentioned our main interaction with the environment is through what, what goes into our alimentary tract, our, our digestive system. And so it has such a profound role. And the people that, you know, when their lives are changed so dramatic, it's almost like, a, I hate to compare it to religion, but it kind of, they have this sort of epiphany where it's like, holy cow, my life is different. And they're so happy and excited. And they want to tell other people about it. So we have this. And as you, anybody that knows this, it's kind of funny because vegans were, I remember a couple of years ago, vegans were like, well, you know, if we just ignore these stupid carnivores, they're going to go away, right? It's going to fizzle out. Well, it's not. It's growing. It's growing every day. There's more and more people that are discovering it, that are giving it a try. A lot of healthcare providers are using it. Maybe it's for selective patient. Maybe it's for the Crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis is some of the autoimmune conditions. And that is a really positive sign that we're getting some people that are at least willing to question the narrative. And I know... Some people say questioning the science, but really is it questioning a narrative, which I think some of the science has become narrative driven. And if you, if you look, unfortunately, the evidence-based medicine, we have to look at how that evidence was acquired. And, you know, if we look at particularly some of the science has been paid for by pharmaceutical companies, you know, they don't even disclose their raw data. They, not even the peer review, reviewers see that stuff, which is just so you get they're, they're reviewing what the, what the pharmaceutical companies said the data showed. They're not, they're not reviewing the data. They're reviewing the pharmaceutical company's interpretation of that. It's just a mess. So we have a, a plague of comfort, you know, in, in society now. Everybody's, you know, just kicking back, chilling back, uh, you know, watching their Netflix, playing their video games, you know, just kind of uh, waiting for the universal basic in income so they can just sit around and, you know, <laughs> be fed processed food and not do anything. And, uh, you know, some people want that. Some people don't. I don't. I mean, I don't, I don't want that. I want it for my children. And, uh, you know, I, hopefully there's enough people that, you know, share the same sentiment. I think there is. And I think the message is spreading. I will say the uh, carnivore diet makes you hotter. <laughs> It brings, it's, it's, it brings, it's bringing sexy back, you know, and <laughs> my colleagues who've tried it have all just gotten significantly hotter. I'm like, Hey, you guys check out, you know, Sean Baker, check out Paul Saldino, check out this, this information. And, and they, they implement. And, and then next time I see them, I'm like, you just look significantly hotter. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's kind of funny if you look at, cause you know, obviously it's a, by and large, there's a lot of red meat in a carnivore diet for men, most people. Uh, if you look back at, you know, like the, the, the Kellogg's brothers from the turn of the night to 20th century, you know, they were, they were banning red meat because they felt it 
it, it increased carnal urges and, and we don't want that because that's you know it's, that's sinful and, and so they you know, feed everybody cereal instead and so that's what we kind of have we have a bunch of you know i mean we have a, you know unfortunately we have and it's not hard to look better when we when we when we look at where we're at as a society we have so many men i'll pick on men because i don't get as much i don't get beat up as much when i pick up when i get beat up more when i when i sort of question women being obese but when, you know men take it better but we have all these sort of doughy floppy <laughs> yeah. you know estrogenized men that are that are just i mean it's even you know joe rogan was just on talking about you know men are turning into they're becoming the equivalent of pugs you know going from wolves to being bred down into a pug <laughs> is, is that where we're going i mean we're going to have a different like almost an almost an unrecognizable species i suppose i don't know and and but but once you switch it around and you start eating you know eating more meat and, and actually doing something yeah, it's pretty easy to get get in better, better be be more attractive, I suppose. Well, and then the piece too. I've always been big into strength training, but I was just uh, in the past few years, and I think part of it was my gut and the stress levels. But my joints were just not handling the load that I was putting on them, and it was it, I was breaking down too fast, and I wasn't recovering well. And I was even using exogenous testosterone for a while to try to heal my joints up, and it was working. But then, of course, I started aromatizing and cause I was drinking too much and I wasn't even drinking very much, but I was getting a little hyper estrogenized and I'm kind of a low estrogen girl. Naturally. I'm kind of a skinny girl. I like, I run lean and I feel good that way. Um, and I was able to completely cut the testosterone out and actually all my hormones. I mean, I might do a little progesterone at a certain part of my cycle, just right before my period, but my cycles are totally normal and healthy. And I am able to, like my strength is increasing significantly in the gym and I'm recovering really, really well. So I'm living it, you know, it's like, and I've tried everything. I've tried every diet out there. I've been, I've been reading nutrition books since I was 14, since I could waltz down to the library on the corner and I was digging out the zone diet and protein power and all those books, like as a kid. And I've been in this world of naturopathic medicine a long, long time. So I've kind of seen it all come and go. And uh, just the regulation, my, my blood pressure has so is my husband's. I didn't even have high blood pressure. I'm such a low blood pressure girl that when it got to normal, quote unquote, normal, that was high for me and everything, you know, and cutting the drinking has helped. But I think the, the key here really is the strength training component is such a critical, it's such a beautiful sort of synergistic way to go about. You're going to shift your diet. You might as well start picking up some weights and, and moving some weight around. Can you, I don't want to keep you too long, but can you just touch on that real quick? Cause I know you're big and I like watching your videos. You're always doing cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, it is so incredibly important. I mean, from just, you know, lean, you know, strength training is going to, going to kind of, uh, result in more lean mass, you know, or retention of lean mass and lean mass has such a positive impact on not only how we feel and function, uh, it has impacts on our mental health. I mean, we just feel better. We feel more confident. We don't feel as anxious when we're a little bit stronger. Uh, it protects us from cardiovascular disease. It protects us from cancer. It protects us from dementia. It protects us from type two diabetes. I mean, there's there's probably nothing it doesn't help with, and it doesn't matter if you're male, if you're female. It doesn't matter if you're 20. It doesn't matter if you're 80. You should be doing things that support lean mass, and those things, in many cases, are going to involve strength training. I think strength training is one of the most effective and efficient ways to do that. You know, if you're in there, if you think you're doing yoga and that's going to do it, that's, I mean, it's not much. It's not it's not going to move the needle like you could. Uh, the most effective way is to get in the gym and pick up something heavy or, or, or do some heavy resistance training, you know, and again, diet supports that adequate protein. I think most of us get too little protein. I know there's a big push from some of these longevity gurus. Well, protein in worms makes them die earlier and some other nonsense, which it doesn't hold up in human, human data for sure. I mean, and even if it did, uh, you get a trade off between sarcopenic obesity and frailty with d diminished function that's no, nobody wants to live there. I mean, every person I ever saw over a hundred years of age or closing to close to a hundred was a demented old woman in a diaper coming in on a stretcher with a broken hip, you know, and smelling of urine and screaming how she doesn't want to be a hundred. I mean, that is not where I want to be. And so, you know, if, if that's the case, take me out when I'm 80 or whatever. But besides that, you, we know that if you eat protein and adequate amounts and resistance training, you're most likely, you're just as likely to live for a long period of time and have a much better quality of life. And so resistance training is absolutely vital. When it comes to bone mineral density, um, you know, particularly in female postmenopausal women, as you know, particularly thin ones, particularly Caucasian and Asian women have a very high rate of, of, of fracture. 
And so that's another group that needs to be very, very uh, diligent about maintaining mass and strength. One of the best things you can do if you can do it is jumping, actually, jumping and landing. That has that, that provides tremendous signaling to your to your bones to lay down and, and stay strong. Uh, your point making about that I didn't feel like it because everything hurt, that's really important because what I find in a lot of people is you tell them, hey, go to the gym, work out, start lifting, and they're like, it hurts too much. And they're not going to do it because you, it just hurts. So you've got to figure out how to get them out of pain first. Diet has a huge role in that. And that's what I tell people. I get people come to me, they're 50 years old, they're broken, everything hurts, they're overweight, their blood pressure sucks, or their, you know, their glucose is too high. Go on a some kind of diet. I like, a, you know, if you want to do a carnivore diet, that's great. Fix all those things, and then you're going to stop hurting. And once you stop hurting, you feel better. And then all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to go for a walk. And then a couple months later, you're going to be, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk, and now I'm going to start doing some some sprints on the bike, and then I'm going to start, you know, maybe picking up some weights. And it's a process, but it's a process you need to pursue. And then once you get there, once you get to where you want to be or need to be, don't let go. You can't, you can't take a break, particularly as you get older. You take a week off, it's hard to recover, so I don't take any time. I never take time off. You know, it's, I mean, a day or two here and there, but I never take a week or two off. It just doesn't happen at this age, and it shouldn't, quite honestly. No, you're a machine. I had COVID the same time you did, and it kicked my ass for about five days. It really kicked my husband's ass, and it hit him particularly hard. I was watching your videos, and you're swinging your big ass kettlebell <laughs> like a thousand reps whilst having COVID. And I'm over here on the couch rocking a fever, like I can't wait to get up again because you're right. You take a week off, and it's brutal coming back. It's yes, yeah. it's not easy. You got to stay on top of it. But yeah, you inspired. Well, you always inspire me, but you inspired me highly during that week. I was like, I cannot wait. You know, I changed the flip the script instead of like, oh, I'm laying here being sick. I'm like, I cannot wait to get back to my kettlebells because that's yeah. the goal, right? I got to get over this and get off the couch. Absolutely. Yeah, it's important to say, you know, laying down, you know, you do that and you sleep when you're dead, right? That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a mantra there, but no, I mean, you got, you know, obviously you got to recovER, but I mean, you know, again, if, you, if your diet and everything's on point, recovery is pretty quick. I mean, I, I, like I said, there, there's, I, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm in my mid fifties and I'm still training with 20 year olds and rolling in jujitsu and, you know, getting the hell beat out of me and beating the hell out of people and still training, lifting. And, you know, some days I'm doing two, three workouts a day and, uh, you know, and I'm eating meat, eating a bunch of meat and eggs, and, and that works pretty well. Yeah. How many eggs do you eat in a day? Uh, you know, it varies. Right now, I'm in a, I'm in a fairly egg-dominant period of time, so I've got, I just bought 250 eggs. It'll last me about two weeks, so I'm averaging, <laughs> I'm averaging, you know, 16, 17 eggs a day, something like that. Some days it'll be at 12, some days it'll be 24, uh, something like that. But, you know, it's, again, remember, I'm six foot five, 250 pounds, and still... Yeah. It's not that, you know, a dozen eggs is only about 700 calories, 720 calories, something like that. It's not that much, right? So it's not really like that's all that much, particularly if I'm not eating anything else. I mean, I'm eating steak with that, but, you know, I'm, I'm still 300, 3,000, 4,000 calories a day, which is not all that much for, you know, for me. Yeah. For an active guy like you, I was just telling my husband last night, I was like, baby, you got to eat more eggs. Cause I cook them up a bunch of hard boiled eggs for work. And yeah. he said, I had two. And I said, I had two. I'm a little thing. You got to eat more <laughs> five minimum a day. Come on. I had, you gotta I get had on eight. I, I had eight. I had a big old, like a pound and a half uh, top sirloin and eight for breakfast. So I mean, how do you, how do you, I, I have such a hard time consuming enough food. I, I mean, literally my stomach doesn't want to hold it. It's just, yeah. it's, do you ever have any advice for anyone or is there, I mean, I know it's not an easy question. Yeah. Well, I mean, any... for me, I, I, you know, it's not for me, I have no problem. I can, I still eat like a 300 pound dude. You know, I, mm -hmm. I still have that appetite. So I think it's just one of the things is, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, um, again, I can talk in this context of a carnivore diet, but if we want to eat more, you know, if you, if you follow the, 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 how most Americans eat, they eat continuously. They, they, you know, they, they eat for 16 hours a day. You know, it's uh, wake up, have a, have breakfast, have a snack at 10, have another, have lunch, have another snack, have another snack, have dinner, have another snack. You know, I mean, that's how Americans eat more frequent, more frequent eating allows you to eat more calories. You can do that, you know, uh, it, you know, um, if you want to. So what I would say is, you know, like, like a lot, like people on a, on a low carb diet or carnivore diet will you often eat infrequently because you're just not hungry. It's so satiating, you know, like I'll eat steak and eggs for breakfast. I literally, if I didn't force myself, I would, I could not eat anything until tomorrow. I mean, I, I could sit there and not be that hungry. Uh, maybe I, maybe I would have a small snack or something like that, but if I want to, um, but so what I do is, you know, if I, if I decrease the portion per meal and then just increase the meal frequency. So instead of like, so let's say you're going to eat, I don't know, let's say you eat 1,500 calories a day, 7, 15, two meals. 
and you want them up to 2,000. So, you, you know, so instead you go, you say, I'm going to eat 850 calories three times a day. You know, instead, or whatever, did I add it right? No, yeah, something like that. So, good enough. <laughs> no, I didn't know. I, so, I got to do the math 600 and 666 calories three times a day instead of two times 750. Something like that. You know, seasoning can often make the food more palatable. You know, if I eat, like, there's people out there, they'll eat, like, you know, they don't have any salt on the meat, it's less palatable, they eat less. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but salt makes it more palatable. And so there's things to make things more, you know, the food industry knows this. I mean, this is a whole bliss point, you know, salt, sugar, fat, you make that combination and, and it's, people can't stop eating it. So if you, carbohydrates, there's another thing, carbohydrates drive appetite. Yeah. Um, we know that, uh, you know, if you look at, like we, I mentioned earlier, it's a tiny hormone, CCK, uh, peptide YY, uh, you know, ghrelin, uh, those things, uh, you know, are responsive to the dietary composition and carbs inhibit the satiety signals, you know, that, that you know, CCK and pepto YY do. And so if you put introduce carbohydrates into the food, you're going to eat a little more. So again, again, it's some, again, I'm not pro or con car carbohydrates. Some people don't do well with them. Some people it's fine. But if you mm -hmm. want to eat more you listen to guys like Stan Efferding, who trains the world's strongest men to eat and to get bigger. The reason he puts rice in the diet, and he'll add dextrose to the rice because it makes it more palatable, and they just eat more because they need to eat seven, eight, nine, ten thousand calories a day to get to 350, 400 pounds. And so wow. that's, those are some of the hacks that uh, people do. Um, but yeah, I interviewed. You know, I had the. I had the, a few years ago. I interviewed a gal named Molly Schuyler who is a competitive eater. She's like a world champion competitive eater. And I thought what fascinated me about her was, so it's a cute little story. She went up to Madison, Wisconsin. They had an all-you-can-eat prime rib dinner. The record was 10 pounds. And she goes in there, and she's not big. She's only about 120 pounds. She's not Oh, she's wow. Well, she rolls in there and says, hey, you know, if I eat the 10 pounds, and if I eat more, can I keep going? And I say, yeah, of course. You just keep going as far as you want. So she goes in there and, you know, just sits down and, quickly demolishes 10 pounds of prime rib and keeps going. He gets through 15 pounds and then gets to 20 pounds and then gets to 22 and a half pounds. And the restaurant announces we are completely out. You ate everything we had. So the record stopped because the restaurant ran out of food. So she's, she ate 22 and a half pounds of food in one sitting, which is interestingly, that, that is what a gray wolf will eat at max capacity. So a gray wolf weighs about 140 pounds. And they can wolf down on about 22 pounds of food. If you look it up, it's kind of that's kind of interesting. So she could eat as much of a, as a wolf uh, as that's a small amazing. human. So, so it's God, that's amazing. I, I don't know how people pack that kind of food away. Side note: I was just at the La Brea Tar Pits, which I've wanted to go to my entire oh, life. Yeah, all the mammoths and stuff. Yeah, yeah, never been there. Grew up in Southern California and uh, had always wanted to go. So I finally got to go, and I saw a skeleton of a dire wolf, and I was so disappointed. I thought it was going to be a much more massive animal. I had it, this Game of Thrones dire oh, wolf yeah, in my yeah. head, and I was so excited that they existed. And here's this little, like, it wasn't much bigger than my Great Dane. Uh, <laughs> so. Sorry to disappoint you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so quickly before we wrap up, I want to make sure people have enough time to hear about your community and all your offerings. But tell people what a uh, hip fracture means to them. Well, I, you know, again, there, if it's due to osteoporosis, like an older person, right? I mean, if you're in a car wreck and you break your hip, that's that's a different story. But yeah, if you, if you get older and your your hip breaks, and the question is, you know, did, did the hip break because you lost your balance and you fell on it? Sometimes I mean, the hip just breaks and people fall. I mean, it literally snaps while you're standing there. What that often means is probably within a year, about 30 to 40% chance you'll be dead. Okay, so that's pretty bad. So many of them are end up dead after a hip fracture. But it it is basically again it's a canary in a coal mine if, if, if it means you're basically falling apart and you're going to die soon anyway i mean that's what it, that's what ultimately it means but i mean it's you know it's usually uh depending on the type of fracture it might be it might require a hip replacement uh it might require like a little metal rod that goes in there the fortunate thing is we can fix hips and most people can get up and be walking within a day that's our goal however most people will lose some level of ambulation it may mean you're chronically on a cane, you're chronically on a walker, uh, you lose functional independence, uh, you're gonna be, you know, you might have, uh, you know, difficult time going to the bathroom. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of sort of downsides. You know, it's, it's better not to break your hip for sure, but preventing that is, is 
you know, with, with all this time ahead of time. So if you're 50 and you don't have a broken hip when you're 75 as a female, you need to be working right now because it's coming if you don't do anything about it. And so it's, it's, it's definitely, um, I, it's so common. I can talk to me. I can, I remember on call when I had one call Saturday, I did seven of them, seven little old ladies broke their hip and you know, I was just like a machine. Next tip, next tip, you know, and, and the, the nice thing is I could, I could fix a broken hip in about 10, 15 minutes, depending on the fracture type. It was a very quick procedure. You know, you just kind of, you know, particularly if they're thin, which is nice, you know, you get the thin patients, make a little decision and, you know, slap the, you know, put the, <laughs> the metal rod in there, throw a couple of screws in, sew them up and you're done. And, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's usually, it carries a pretty high mortality rate, you know, quite honestly. And, uh, uh, you know, time in the hospital, time away from your family, you know, definite, you know, inconvenience, you know, you have to change your whole household around, you know, your house may not be, may, may not be, uh, you know, just stairs. You want to go up, the, up and down stairs. If you have stairs in your house, you might have to have your house remodeled to, to, to facilitate your level of ambulation afterwards. Yeah. And increased risk of pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, the risk of mortality persists that high risk persists for, you know, five, 10 years. Well, if you live that long. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you know, again, it just means for most people. And again, the osteo, and we mentioned this earlier, the osteoporosis is associated with poor metabolic health, poor mm -hmm. medical metabolic health is associated with everything else, dementia, you know, infectious risks, heart disease, you know, all those things. Perfect. Yeah, that's it. I love it. Well, tell the audience where they can find you. Okay. So if you are, and this is not for the meek, you can go to my Instagram, <laughs> Sean, S H A W N Baker, B A K E R one nine six seven. Um, I've got an, a, a YouTube channel, which I put out, you know, a couple of videos a day, uh, Sean Baker, MD. I'm on Twitter S Baker, MD. I'm on, what is that other one? Oh, the, 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 the funny one, TikTok S Baker, MD. no, Sean Baker, MD. I, I still laugh that I'm on TikTok, but, um, and then Rivero, you know, if you go to Rivero.com, I literally host a live meeting every single day, seven days a week at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm there for an hour. I interact with everybody. If you want to talk with me directly, that's a way. I, I do do some individual consultations still. So if, if that's an interest that you want to do is talk about some lifestyle stuff. And I do that as well. You can you can also access that through Rivero. And that's R-E-V-E-R-O.com. So that's where you can find me. I love it. I love it. I'm so happy you came on. I really appreciate this and you taking the time. I'm a big fan and I love your work and I love the message you're putting out into the world and I love your bravery. So keep it up and thank you for being on my podcast. Well, wonderful. Thank you for having me.